All right, so the last two times we talked about how uncertainty can affect the constraints as well as the objective. And we looked at how we might reformulate our constraints so that we weren't uh, uh, getting a lot of failures under that uncertainty, right? We made them more reliable. We also looked at different ways we might formulate the objective, considering things like the mean, variance, other statistics of interest that can give us a design that is less sensitive to the variation. So at the heart of all of these uh, methods is that we need some way to propagate our input uncertainties to the output uncertainties. We call this uh, for propagation. So uh, imagine this is your model, right? And, and generically, we'll think of X as inputs, F as outputs. Those inputs could be design variables. They could also be parameters. As we mentioned before, the parameters, um, even though they may be fixed in the optimization, they can have uncertainty that affects the outputs. And so we need to consider those. So for example, I have some inputs coming in, you know, let's say this is X1, but it's not a deterministic quantity, right? It's, it's really uh, some sort of distribution. And, you know, I might choose to, uh, well, I could characterize it by mean and a variance, but in general, it's some distribution. And then there's some other inputs, X2, you know, which has some other sort of distribution and so on. And what I need to know is for my outputs, which in our context is generally gonna be the objective constraints, all or maybe some subset of them, right? So now I've got F1, F2, F3, and so on. Um, I need to know what these output distributions look like for these different, uh, variables, okay? So these are things that we input. We either uh, have to characterize them or know them somehow or assume them based on some data or our past experience with these variables, just like our, our input parameters. Um, and now we need a way to propagate them through our model and figure out what the output distributions or at least the output statistics look like. You'll remember that often we looked at things like mu of f and sigma of f, and we use these in, in our objectives and constraints. So we need to be able to calculate these things. Okay, so um, we talked about one of these methods already. This is a first order perturbation method. It's relatively straightforward. It uses derivatives, um, and it, it's the method that you know is commonly seen with uh, experimental data. And uh, just to rewrite this again, it just shows that the mean of an output is just evaluation, evaluation of the function using the means of the inputs. And then variances are just given by uh, the sum of derivatives. We have the partial of f with respect to each input times the standard deviation of the input squared. Okay. And so this method is relatively straightforward to use. Um, it's not uh, necessarily the most accurate. It relies on a first order Taylor series. Um, there are higher order Taylor series that have been used, but they're at a lot of complexity, usually aren't worthwhile as compared to other methods. And they do assume symmetry in the PDFs. So we're only getting here a mean and a variance. We don't get any other sort of statistics, um, but if we can get derivatives, uh, in a fairly straightforward way, these can these can be a, an effective approach to use. Okay, so that's just one method. We're going to talk about four methods today. Um, next method is called direct quadrature, and quadrature um, is just another name for numerical integration. We've done these kind of things before, uh, at least in in one dimension. Say, for example, using the trapezoidal rule, rectangle rule, maybe Simpson's rule. We've seen these kind of things for doing uh, numerical inter integration or quadrature. And uh, this approach tries to estimate the statistics, just recognizing the fact that these are just integrals, right? If we go back to the definition, the mean of a function, um, also the, if we, we could call it the expected value of f, is the integral of f times a probability density function. Okay, this is that PDF with a probability density function. 
So if the input distribution was normal or uniform or some arbitrary distribution like the wind farm, um, and let's say this is power, for example, in that wind farm example, then this integral would give me my average power, the expected value of the power. Okay, this is just a, a general formula. Uh, it's always true, right? And this is the definition of variance. It's the expected value of f minus the mean squared. So it's it's the deviation from the mean. But as we talked about last time, a deviation plus or minus would cancel out. So it's the squared deviation from the mean. So uh, as a formula, I'm, I'm going to simplify it a bit. I mean, there are many ways to write it, but um, there's one way. It ends up looking like this. There's a little bit of math that was done there one step. But in either case, the point is that these are just integrals, right? This is a known input, my probability density function. This is something I can output. This is that function I'm trying to evaluate. So I could evaluate that function at multiple points and do an integral. And just generally speaking, right, let's do an even simpler case, like forget about those above integrals, but just in general, quadrature just means that I take this integral that I want to evaluate, which you know is uh, 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 requires infinitesimal space or infinite number of points, and I approximate it uh, as a discrete summation where I evaluate my function at some discrete points and I multiply it by some weights. That's just some general form. And the weights and the locations that I choose to evaluate will vary depending on the method. Uh, so for example, you know, you've, you've probably done this before, right? Where if you've got, uh, say this function here, here's f of x, right? And you could do um, something like a trapezoidal rule where you broke this up to little segments, right? And you approximated these as trapezoids over each segment. Imagine that was a straight line, right? So uh, that's one approach. You could use a rectangle rule. Um, there are others that you may not be as familiar with, like Clenshaw Curtis, Gauss Conrad, and so on. Um, different strategies and, and some adaptive methods, but uh, they all boil down to where we choose to evaluate these, what we call collocation points and then the associated weights. Okay. Um, it's fairly straightforward in 1D. The difficulty, um, which is pertinent for us in this, in this application, is that we generally have multiple uncertain variables. So we need to do this integration across multiple dimensions. Sometimes this is called cubature, but most generally, I still just refer to this as quadrature. The problem with this is that uh, the number of points that we need to evaluate grows exponentially. This is a, a curse of dimensionality that sometimes referred to. Um, so, for example, you know, let's say to do approximate this integral well in one D, I needed thirty points. Well, now if I've got uh, you know a second dimension, so here's one input variable and another. I've got you know these 30 points here, and I've got 30 points here. I now need to evaluate every combination of that 30 times 30 or 900 points, right? And as I add a th another dimension, uh, you know that becomes what is that like 27,000 or something? Uh, it's going to become n to the uh, d power, right? So this scales with the number of points I use times d is the dimension. So this is 1d, this one is 1d, whoops, 1d, 2d. So it quickly becomes very expensive. Um, so a technique that's commonly used is what are called sparse grid methods. Uh, the idea is that um, I could evaluate my integral with a smaller number of well-chosen points that maintains the same accuracy, but with fewer points. So for example, this is, this is, a, this is not a trapezoidal rule, this is called a Clenshaw-Curtis rule. Um, here it is just on a, a domain of minus one to one. These are all the points you'd have to evaluate. And this is a grid, this is called a level five sparse grid. You can choose different levels of sparsity um, for the Clenshaw-Curtis rule. And these are the points I'd have to evaluate at, okay? And they're optimally chosen here, well chosen here, so that I can maintain a similar accuracy, but with far fewer points. 
this scales instead of as um, n to the d here, this scales as uh, n log n to the d minus one power. So uh, it still is going to scale up with dimensions. It's going to become hard as you get to higher dimensional problems. Um, so it does alleviate the problem somewhat, but even still, you know, this is going to become still a lot of points to evaluate if you have lots of input dimensions. But these techniques can be effective for reducing the amount of evaluation points in higher dimensions. Okay, so that's the second approach. The third approach is called um, Monte Carlo, and it's really a class of many variations. Um, Monte Carlo methods um, basically boil down to a few simple steps here. Um, in effect, what we're trying to do is approximate these same integrals, right? Um, or other statistics. But the idea is that uh, we, can ran we can choose random samples from these input distributions. If I go all the way back to these input distributions, um, I'm just going to sample from this, right? I'm going to randomly choose a value from this distribution, run my function, and get an output. And if I do that enough times, right, and I just randomly choose according to this distribution, right, run my function, get an output, then I can collect statistics based on those outputs. You know, I can get the full distribution. I can estimate statistics like mean and variance. Um, and if I have, you know, the law of large numbers says that if I have enough samples, I should converge to the true values. Uh, that, by the way, is the main disadvantage is that it's relying on the law of large numbers, meaning we need to evaluate lots of things. So, you know, if I was to say this as, as steps, roughly speaking, right, we randomly sample the inputs. Um, and we evaluate the function. And then we compute statistics on the outputs. Compute statistics. Okay. The nice thing about this approach is it's uh, very simple to apply. We already have a function and we already know how to evaluate it. So all we have to do is just generate a whole bunch of random inputs and call the function a bunch of times. And once I call it a bunch of times, I get a whole bunch of outputs and I can just take the average of those outputs. I can take the variance of those outputs. I could plot them on a histogram and see a PDF. I could look at uh, percentiles. I can get whatever statistics I want. And unlike some of the other methods like the first we've looked at, I can get actual distributions, right? I can get, I don't get just the mean and the variance, but you know, like let's say I get this histogram here. I can get a distribution of what the output should look like, okay? But as we said, the main disadvantage here is that it requires lots of samples. Okay, so disadvantage, that's the con, requires large n. Okay, it does have some pros though. I mean, one is it's kind of easy to use, but the biggest one is that um, convergence is independent of D. So remember D was the dimensionality. So I could have a big dimensional space. If I went back to this picture here, right? Imagine I have lots of X's. Uh, it doesn't really matter how many there are because I'm just picking these random numbers from them. And once I have them, I can evaluate them all at the same time, right? This is just, I just have this input vector of inputs and it's just a big bunch of numbers that I evaluate anyway. And, and so since they all come from these random sampling, which is very cheap to generate, uh, increasing D doesn't really matter. Um, I can still just get all these outputs at the same time and I, I, for all these different inputs. Uh, but to well approximate these, I have to run lots of samples. So N is big. So sometimes this can be a preferable method if I have a high dimensional problem, even though, um, uh, and it still needs to be large, it may still be preferable because some of the other methods won't scale well in high dimensions. So again, n does need to be large. And, and, and the other downside there is we don't actually know how big n needs to be. So we generally need to do a uh, convergence, some convergence testing. It's often a bit noisy. So again, that pushes us even larger n values. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, the scaling, just to give you an idea, 
the basic method scales as one over the square root of n, okay? So in other words, if you wanted to get three more significant digits, you know, so you wanted to divide your accuracy by a thousand, then you would need to do a million more samples, right? And it would have to be 10 to the six, because 10 to the six square root is 10 to the third. So just to get three more digits of accuracy, you'd have to do a million times as many samples. Um, there are other methods we'll talk about in a second that will scale a little better, right? Like uh, order one over n. Uh, still requires a lot, right? So to get those three extra digits, we need to do a thousand times the number of samples, uh, but that's much better, okay? So how can we do that? Well, uh, we've actually already talked about the methods to do this before. So instead of just randomly sampling, um, we want to choose samples that are going to provide a good coverage of this distribution. Okay, so we talked about some of these methods when we discussed um, surrogate base optimization. Latin hypercube sampling can help us to speed up this convergence. Uh, another method is to use the low discrepancy sequences that we talked about. That's a popular method for Monte Carlo because as we add more samples, right, because we don't know how big n is, so we have to test some value of n, see how well it converges, make it a bigger number, make it a bigger, 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 and bigger number, and see when the statistics start converging. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, but with the low discrepancy sequences, as we add more samples, we don't have to throw away the old ones. So that's a popular method. In fact, that combination of Monte Carlo with low discrepancy sequences is often called quasi Monte Carlo, and that can scale better. Okay. Um, so just to give you an example, here's, um, here's a simple function. Uh, this is an example in the book, so you can look at it later, but it's just a uh, I think I squared a bunch of inputs. There are three inputs. Two of them were uncertain. And this is the type of convergence testing you need to do. So because beforehand, I don't know how big n needs to be to get good statistics. So if I do regular, just random sampling, I randomly generate some numbers and, and I sample f. And f in this case, I don't remember what it is, but I'll just write something, something like this. You know, there's like a coefficient times another number. Right there are a few variables, something like that. Okay. Um, that's not actually what it is, but it's close to that. Uh, I just randomly generate numbers here, and these were both assumed to be normally distributed. And um, so in, the, in this example, this was deterministic, but both of these were assumed to be normally distributed and for some given uh, standard deviation. Okay, so we sample under that normal distribution, we evaluate f, and we do it enough times and then we calculate what the mean is. So that's what's shown here on the right. And as I increase n, I have more and more samples. We see that this starts to converge, okay? So before it gives me pretty, in, pretty inaccurate estimates, you know, with 100 samples or 1,000 samples, it's a log scale here. But after, you know, say about, I don't know, 10 to the fifth here, 100,000 samples, uh, it's looking pretty good as far as random sampling goes. Um, if I use Latin hypercube sampling, I, it looks like I can converge much quicker. Uh, the Halton is that low discrepancy sequence or quasi Monte Carlo. It converges more smoothly and it also converges quicker. Uh, the advantage here, as far as the convergence study, is that when I do Latin hypercube, each time I go to a new point, I have to generate all new samples. So if I, if I go from 1,000 to 2,000 samples, I throw away the existing 1,000 and I just do all new 2,000 and same for each step. Whereas with the Halton, as I go from 1,000 to 2,000, I just add the new ones. Um, that actually is, uh, so Monte Carlo is used more broadly. That's an advantage for Monte Carlo in general. That's less of an issue or less of an advantage for um, optimization under uncertainty because what's gonna happen is once we do this convergence study and decide what N is gonna be, that's fixed. And then we're gonna run an optimization where we're calculating these statistics again and again as X changes during the optimization. So uh, that advantage quickly goes away because the real cost of the optimization is that iteration, not this sort of pre-processing step. So often we actually just use Latin hypercube sampling because um, it uh, gives a good spread. Okay, so uh, even still though, with Latin hypercube sampling, you know, the, the variance tends to converge not as uh, more slowly than the mean. Means converge usually a little bit easier. Uh, 
And if you look at other things like reliability, which I'm not plotting here, those tend to converge even later. But you know, let's say I need, you know, there's still some wiggles here, it depends what kind of accuracy, but something on the order of 10,000 samples. And this is a really simple function. Um, but that, that's pretty typical of needing tens, hundreds, millions of samples to get uh, decent statistics. And remember, this has to be done at every iteration in the optimization. So every time my design variables change, I need to run these 100,000 samples, get a mean and a variance, update my objectives and constraints, and do that at every single iteration. So this can become very expensive, um, but it may be the only tractable method if I have a high dimensional, uh, not high dimensional in, in terms of number of design variables, but high dimensional in terms of the stochastic variables, the variables that have uncertainty associated with them. Um, but again, Monte Carlo is easy to use. And what you should do in any of these methods is not to randomly generate new samples every time. Pick the random sampling beforehand and keep that fixed at every iteration. Otherwise, you're adding just extra noise. This makes the optimization more difficult. So do your random sampling, like choose those 100,000 samples. And at every iteration, the optimization will use those same uh, sampling locations. Um, just with updated values for X, or, or I should say the same random numbers sampled from those input distributions. That'll give you smooth outputs, um, which is especially important if you want to use gradient-based optimization, but, but in general, it'll be helpful. Okay, and then the advantage of this method, though, is that I don't get just mean and variance. I can calculate any other statistics because I get uh, output distribution, right? I, I sampled all those functions and round them through so I can plot a histogram, I can get a full distribution of output. So I can get other types of statistics um, other than just a mean invariance, which can be uh, you know, misleading or, or not enough information in many cases. All right, so that's Monte Carlo and it has, as I mentioned, a wide variety of uses, uh, but the main idea is that when it's difficult to evaluate uh, integrals or other things. Um, we can do it in a method that's independent of the number of dimensions, but it requires still a large number of samples, um, basically just by relying on the law of large numbers to get output statistics. Okay, a fourth method that I will talk about briefly is called polynomial chaos. Um, the idea here is that uh, if uh, that our outputs are generally going to be smooth functions. And so we can take advantage of that structure um, instead of just doing this quadrature where we just are evaluating points and we assume no relationship between them, or some methods can, but, but we're going to try to uh, approximate these outputs as smooth distributions um, using often polynomial approximations. It actually doesn't need to be a polynomial and it has nothing to do with chaos actually just this was one of the uh, it was first derived for for a, a physical theory of chaos not for this forward propagation so the name kind of stuck with that and, and it doesn't really have to do with polynomials necessarily although that's very common and the idea is this imagine I have some output function of interest f of x I can approximate that as a sum of these basis functions and coefficients, okay? Um, this is, if you've seen Fourier series before, this is a similar idea. This is actually a generalized uh, and we'll say truncated form of a Fourier series because we actually don't go all the way to infinity. Instead, we're just gonna use n plus one terms. You can start at zero and end at n. Okay, so again, a Fourier series could be used, but uh, these size, are just going to be any sort of orthogonal function. Um, in Fourier series, we use these sinusoids that are orthogonal, but um, more commonly uh, for these applications, we use different types of polynomials. And the idea is that um, these basis functions, these polynomials, uh, we choose them according to our probability distribution function to try to capture the output distribution uh, quickly. So with, with a small number of basis functions, we might be able to approximate some sort of output distribution uh, you know, with a small number of polynomials. Uh, 
So that's that's the main idea. Um, there are different types of polynomials. They all need to form a orthogonal basis. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, you're familiar with orthogonality from a from vectors, right? So we would say that two vectors are orthogonal, u and v, if their dot product was zero. Well, the same idea works for functions, or a similar idea, but functions are infinite dimensional, right? So we can't have this summation that occurs here, but rather an integral. So we would say the two functions are orthogonal um, if their inner product is zero. So here's an example of inner product. There are many. So we could say f and g are, are orthogonal if when we integrate over this interval, they're equal to zero. Okay, that's the simplest one. Um, the one that we're actually going to use is called a weighted inner product. And so it would say that f and g, and we're going to use these brackets to symbolize this formula, they are orthogonal if the integral of a or b of f of x times g of x times some weighting function is equal to zero. And actually, the weighting function that we're going to use is the probability density function. This is that PDF for input. OK, so um, this is a property we're going to use. This is what it means to have orthogonal polynomials. And it's the same kind of idea as in a vector space. Um, so you know, to give you simple examples, um, in R2, meaning in two dimensions, these are an orthogonal basis. Uh, and we use those because then we can represent any point just using two uh, basis functions, right? Sometimes we call them i, j, or x hat, y hat, or something like that, right? Um, I could give two, I could have chosen two other basis functions like this, but they're not orthogonal. And so I can't actually represent all the spaces. And so, um, Similarly, if I added another vector and said, well, I want to do this in three dimensions, and I've already got you know, this one and this one, if I add this one, it's not helpful because it's just a linear combination of my existing vectors. Whereas if I add one that comes out of the board, now it's orthogonal to the existing, and I'm increasing the span, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, input space that I can, I can uh, represent with those vectors. So a similar idea exists with orthogonal functions. If I add a function that's not orthogonal, it's already covered by a linear combination, which this is. Oops, this is a linear combination of functions I already have. So I want to make sure to add ones that are orthogonal. All right. So um, once we, uh, so this is the main idea. And so I need to choose basis functions. Uh, the first basis function is always just a constant. So psi of zero. It's just constant one. That's one. So then we multiply by a zero, which is a constant. So we just always have that constant term that we can choose an offset function. So we need to figure out what the others are going to be. So there's kind of three. Oops, copied and pasted some text here. Let me just leave that. Actually, let me just go to the blank page. There'll be a little more room. So there's three things I need to do. I need to select uh, a basis. Uh, and again, they're usually polynomials. Um, and I need to then compute the coefficients. This is psi. Compute coefficients. Those are the alphas. And then I compute statistics. OK, so let me mostly talk about the first and the third here. So for the Basis functions, there are already known sets of basis functions that are that give me exponential convergence. They're optimal for a given input distribution. So for example, if I know that, let's say my input distribution is normal, then uh, I should use Hermite polynomials. Or if it was uniform, then I should use Legendre polynomials. Okay. And there are others for different distributions. And if I have something like the wind farm example, where it's not some known distribution, it's just some you know, weird thing, uh, we can numerically generate um, polynomials that are going to give us uh, this exponential convergence. So we want to choose the right type of polynomial that's going to help us converge much faster or need fewer terms. Okay, but this is just an example, you know, some common ones that are used. 
Okay, I'm going to skip two for the moment and briefly describe that later, but let's see how we can compute statistics, why this idea of um, uh, these orthogonal polynomials is going to be useful for us. So imagine I want to compute some statistics like the mean. We already saw the formula, right? I want to compute the mean. That's just f times p of x dx. That's that integral. But in our case, we know that f of x, or we're approximating it, as a sum of alphas times basis functions, right? So I could plug that in here. So it's going to be a sum of alphas, basis functions, times p of x, dx, OK? And alpha is just a constant, right? This is just a coefficient. So we can take it out of the integral. It doesn't depend on x. And so this is going to become uh, a sum of alphas times integrals of psi times px dx. Or in other words, it would look something like this. It would be um, a0 times the integral of psi 0 p of x dx plus a1 times the integral of psi 1 p of x dx, and so on. OK, now if we go back to here, remember that uh, psi 0 is just 1. And this integral here is always 0. OK, so if I take any of my basis functions, so in other words, what this says is that psi i, psi j equals 0 if i is not equal to j. That's what it means for those to be orthogonal. OK, so we're going to do a little trick here. I'm going to multiply everything by psi 0. And that's just 1, so that didn't change anything. So if I multiply everything, both sides, by 1, right, I get mu f equals um, this term here becomes alpha 0 times psi 0, psi 0, which is just 1. Actually, we could just substitute that in. Let me just leave that like that. Okay. Psi 0 is 1, so I'll just pull that out. And the integral of the probability distribution across the whole thing, minus infinity to infinity, is 1. That's just the definition of a PDF. So that term just goes away. I just have a 0. Okay. And then the next term, I've got alpha 1. And since I multiply by psi 0, this becomes this inner product. I get this one, and so on. But by orthogonality, every one of these is 0. So the mean is just my first coefficient. Okay. Um, the variance. Actually, I have it here. The variance, without working to the math, let me just look at this here. We just do a similar type of trick. We use the orthogonality of the polynomials, and we get something like this, right? So it just depends on getting these alphas and evaluating these products, which are much easier to evaluate than the general integrals, because these only involve the basis functions or those polynomials, which are simple. Often, we can do them analytically. And if not, they are simple numerical integrals. Okay, so uh, that's the idea here behind number three is that once we have these coefficients, these basis functions, getting statistics is pretty quick. It's really easy and straightforward. We know what these are for a given input distribution. These are easy to get. The real challenge here is this step. I'm only going to briefly describe it and you can look in the text for some more details. But um, essentially, we're going to use a similar approach where we're going to use the orthogonality of polynomials. And it comes down to one of either two methods. We have to use quadrature, numerical integration, to evaluate them. Um, and they're going to be terms that uh, uh, looks like this. They're not orthogonal, so they don't go away. Or we can use a least squares approach to estimate these coefficients. Um, you could think of it in some sense as now we're just fitting our output distribution against you know, this polynomial. It's fairly similar to what we did with the surrogate-based optimization where we were choosing uh, these weights. Okay, so a, a linear least squares approach uh, is, a, is an effective strategy there. Okay, but the idea again is that uh, we're just trying to estimate this output distribution and rather than treat it as just this thing that we know nothing about and, and try to break it up in these numerical integrals, we could say, well, what if I could approximation as the sum of these polynomials and maybe I only need a few terms to get it really accurate. And once I do that, then I can get these output statistics really efficiently.
So this is a method that can be really efficient, um, but again, really depends on the types of distributions uh, that we have. Okay, so this is just a quick introduction to some different approaches. As you can see in all of these, um, we really need to be efficient. We have to be really think carefully about how we do this because we're calculating these statistics at every iteration during the optimization. Other than that one trick I mentioned the first time where, where all we're using is constraints, that we could do outside of the optimization pretty uh, in a pretty good approximation, but uh, especially if we're doing objectives, um, we need to evaluate these at every iteration, so it can be expensive. So this is an area of active research, always trying to find ways to make uh, these computations more efficient so that we can um, include them in optimization. As we've seen, that can be really important, right? It really can change the result if we're ignoring this uncertainty we want to be able to include these, but it can be expensive when the optimization is already costly. And then at each iteration, we're now adding a whole bunch of other uh, sampling function valuations in order to compute statistics. Okay, so this is our brief introduction to um, optimization on uncertainty, but it's a, a rich field, lots of uh, interesting opportunities there that you may be interested to look more into the future. See you next time.